willing to shout it from the rooftops. I believe in Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and Savior, and I will not back down. You gotta be willing to take a stand if you're the only person you know that will take a stand. And quit being so concerned about what everybody thinks. When's the last time you heard a really good message on hell? I thought about it and I thought, and I, to be honest, I don't even have the nerve to do this yet and I'm pretty nervy. What would happen if I'd come out into a big conference like this on a Friday night and say, tonight I'm going to talk about how if you don't get right with God, you're going to hell. Preachers preach like that. <laughs> we have to get serious about our walk with God and stop looking around to see what everybody else is doing and make a decision for your own life because you are going to stand before God and only give an account of your life, not anybody else's. And I don't know about you, but I am so excited about God, I can hardly stand myself. And I love God, and I'm full of the Holy Ghost, and I hear from God. <laughs> and you can hear from God, and we can all be led by the Holy Ghost, and God can lead us to do great things. And we don't have to bow down to all the nonsense and the stupidity in the world. We've got to take a stand and rise up and act like the army of God, like we say that we are. And then I added one to these six. <laughs> I don't think William Booth would mind. <laughs> and the one I added is that I think that one of the most frightening things today is that we have a lot of information without revelation. Is anybody kind of feeling where I'm coming from with this? Well, I know, I know, I know. Well, I know. I remember one night going into a church service at my, the church I was part of at that time, and the pastor said he was going to teach on the need to forgive people. And I was so disappointed. I thought, oh, I don't need that. <laughs> Come on, this is when you think you know more than what you really know. Oh, I don't, well, why did I think I didn't need that? Because I'd heard a few sermons on the need to forgive people. And you know, it's like the Holy Ghost said to me, <laughs> oh, you think you don't have any unforgiveness? Well, just wait. And so that night during the service, God showed me two people specifically that I had unforgiveness toward. One of them was a friend of my daughter's who mistreated my daughter and I didn't like it. My daughter wouldn't stand up to her and it just irritated the living daylights out of me. Now mind you, I never prayed for her, but I didn't like her. <laughs> and the other person that God showed me that I didn't like was my own son. I was in unforgiveness toward my own son. And you know why? Because he wasn't as spiritual as I wanted him to be. And I was in leadership at my church and he embarrassed me. Now I'm just telling you the truth. He would sit somewhere in the back of the church and you know, of course I was on the front row because I was a leader. <laughs> Had my own parking place out in front with my name on it. I was a big shot. Come on, is anybody, anybody with me tonight? But my son was about 18, and he'd sit on the back row and slump down in his seat like this. Had this look on his face like, when is this gonna be over? And God showed me, he said, you have unforgiveness toward him because he's not as spiritual as you want him to be.
Surely somebody could take that and use it. <laughs> How many people are you mad at in your family just because they're not what you want them to be? I'm going to go over here and talk to these people. Because you guys are a little boring. How many... How many people are you mad at because they're not what you want them to be? Well, who has assigned me the job of deciding what everybody should be? And whatever would make me think that everybody should be what I am? <laughs> or that they should relate to God the same way that I do? <laughs> well, I left her that night quite feeling quite convicted by a message that I started out wishing the pastor wasn't going to preach because I thought I already knew it. And boy, did I get convicted. And so for a couple weeks, I felt like God kept putting on my heart that he wanted me to go and apologize to my son for kind of rejecting him because he wasn't what I wanted him to be. Man, I didn't want to do that because he was a very strong-willed kid, and I thought if I go and humble myself to him, oh, man, he is going to hold that over my head, and whoo, I didn't want to do it. Is anybody feeling where I'm at, okay? But I had to apply that cross that I'm talking to you about tonight and go do what I knew God was telling me to do no matter how I felt about it. So it took a couple weeks, two or three weeks, and I remember I went into his room one night. I don't remember if Dave was with me or not, but uh, were you with me? Yeah. We, we went into, it was our son, David, who now runs our world missions. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so, oops, I guess God had a plan. It just wasn't my plan. <laughs> Things just weren't moving along at my pace of what I wanted him to move along at. God was just taking a little more time to change David than I wanted him to. And so we went into his room and I, so I told him, I said, you know, David, God has shown me something along these lines. God has shown me that I have unforgiveness toward you simply because you're not as spiritual as I want you to be. And uh, I said, I just want to tell you I'm sorry. And from now on, I accept you as you are. Well, he started to cry. These big tears and he said you have no idea how bad I needed to hear that and now listen listen to what he said he said I would love to have the faith that you and dad have but he said it's just not it's not there for me yet I wish that I felt the way about God that you do but I just don't yet and you know what folks like it or not God has a timing in people's lives And we can't call somebody to a higher level spiritually. The Holy Spirit has to do that. He's the one that has to deal with people. Now, mind you, like I said, I was mad at all these people, but I wasn't praying for them. <laughs> well, you know, for the next six months, it was pretty testy because our son would do things we didn't like. Man, it was hard for me to keep my mouth shut. But I did, I passed the test, and then one day he came and said, he was in a New Year's Eve service at church, and God touched him. And he said, I'm gonna to go to Florida and go to Bible college. He went to a mission school in Florida, went to Costa Rica as a missionary, married a girl that was also a missionary in Costa Rica. After they were there a while, we asked him to come back and work for us, and. He's been working for us, I don't know, 25 years, something like that, and has really, with God's help, has been influential and had a hand in every missions work that we have in 150 nations around the world. Come on, give God praise tonight. And that was a message I didn't want to hear because I didn't think I had a problem with it. How many 
many sermons do we have to hear on something before we do it? <laughs> do you know how many angry people there are in the body of Christ? Do you know how many people that are saved are mad at somebody? And they've heard the messages about forgiveness. Well, see, they know they should forgive, but they don't know. Come on, are you with me tonight? They know, but we can know up here and not do. But let me tell you something, when you know down here, you're going to do it. And one of the best ways to discern if you really know something in the fullest way that you need to know it is to ask yourself whether you're doing it or not. <laughs> hmm, you like that, okay. <laughs> For example, how many of you know that God's Word plainly instructs us not to complain, murmur, and grumble, but to be thankful in all things in every circumstance? How many of you know that? <laughs> How many have heard more than one sermon on that at some point in your life? Okay. How many of you complained about something last week? See, I could just say amen and go home and I've got my point across. Now, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and say that I never complain, but I don't do it very much anymore. And I used to be a chief complainer and I'll tell you why. Because I have studied it enough that I have gotten a reverential fear and awe of complaining because I know by scripture that when I complain and murmur instead of being thankful that I open a door for the devil. So it's more than just a, oops, I had a bad day. <laughs> Be thankful at all times in all things giving thanks no matter what your circumstances might be for this is the will of God for those of you who are in Christ Jesus all right now we know that the Bible says that we are to be promptly obedient to God I mean you know promptly obedient to God wonder how many people there are in here tonight who have a known area of disobedience in your life that you know God's put his finger on, but you just haven't really laid it on the altar yet. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, now. <laughs> here, you know what really provoked me to preach this message? I was sitting one morning having my God time, which thankfully... After many go-arounds, many wrestling matches with God, I now put that first before anything else because I just, I just, I can't do it. I can't do life if I don't start out with God. <laughs> I mean, I just can't. And if you think you can, then you're going to find out someday you can't. So let me just tell you, the sooner you start spending time with God every day on a regular basis, talking to Him, thanking Him, waiting on him a little bit, see if he's got something to say to you. Don't, don't get so caught up in, I don't know what to do when I spend time with God. I think if nothing else, you go sit in a room and say, well, God, here I am. I don't know what to do, but I'm putting you first today. So I'm here. Whatever. <laughs> I don't think it's so much about what we do as the fact that we give God the time. So one morning while I was having my God time, it just dawned on me at the end of that time, and I, I hope you can grasp a hold of what I'm going to try to say to you because it was really what provoked me to do this whole message. I, I was just sitting there thinking, and I thought, you know what? When I was done, I thought, I don't know if I felt God's presence today or not. It doesn't really matter because I know He's here. Now, I don't want you to get that. I don't really know if I felt God's presence or not. <laughs> I don't know if there was any proof in the room that God was there. <laughs> I didn't have a goose bump. I didn't have a word of knowledge. I didn't have a prophecy. I didn't see an angel. <laughs> I didn't get any great revelation. It was frankly just kind of a boring morning. Kind of a, you know, okay, I'm here. 
do this every morning. I'm going to keep doing it till you call me home. But now listen, it didn't matter to me. <laughs> there was a day when it didn't matter to me. Well, I didn't feel God. I don't, I don't feel that my prayers got answered. Everybody else in the church service tonight said they felt the anointing. I didn't feel anything. <laughs> Do you know how long it's been since I've had kind, some kind of a direct word from God about my life? Long time. You say, well, what, what are you doing then? I'm just doing the last thing he told me. <laughs> and you know, I have these special days with God when he just shows out and does something really special for me and something radical, but my faith is not based on that and yours can't be either. You can't say, well, God loves me because my circumstances are good and God doesn't love me because now I went to the doctor and got a bad report and I'm all confused and I don't understand because if God loved me, why in the world would this be happening to me? And now I just think I'm going to quit and give up and all this faith stuff don't even work anyway. <laughs> Did I feel God? I don't know if I felt God. Did you feel God? <laughs> I know that my Redeemer lives. <laughs> he's with me all the time and that he will never leave me nor forsake me I'm asking you tonight what do you know <laughs> I don't want to know what you feel I don't want to know what you think just for tonight I don't even care what you want I want to know what do you really know down deep inside as a revelation? I hope you can say, I know that God is with me every moment of my life, that he will never leave me nor forsake me. I know that everywhere I'm going, God has already been there. He's already prepared the way for me. I know his angels are with me. I know that God loves me. I know his anointing and call is on my life. I know that I have gifts and talents. I know that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I know that my sins are forgiven. What do you know? This is the time for us in the body of Christ to make a decision to believe what's in this book. And I don't mean to just mentally assent to it. I mean, we need to base our life on this and say, I'm going to live according to this book. I'm going to live according to the word of God. And I'll tell you, when you do, oh my gosh. You know, the big OMG <laughs> that we put on all of our text messages. Oh my gosh. It is going to be amazing what God is going to do in the earth. We have to stop being led around by our feelings and our emotions. Now, just for the sake of giving emotions the respect that they're due, let me just say that feelings are not evil, but neither are they holy. They're not sanctified. They simply must be assessed and inventoried for what they are. Emotions are sometimes helpful, at other times they're hurtful. <laughs> they're ever-changing and often for no apparent reason. They come in negatives and positives. They're apt to quit on you when you need them and flare up when you wish they would go away. Not wanting them doesn't make them go away, and wanting them doesn't make them come. <laughs> we have to stop letting our feelings dictate what we're going to do and go deeper than that to what we know we should do. What do you know you should do? We don't get to stay mad at somebody because we feel like it. If we know we need to go and make peace, then we need to go and make peace. Be not weary in well-doing. Don't get tired of doing the right thing. Because in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And I might add that you are going to have to do the right thing sometimes for a long time before you get a right result. 
But we don't do what's right to get a result. We do what's right because we love God. Feelings seem to have a mind of their own. They make us laugh one moment and cry the next. <laughs> sometimes you want to hug somebody, sometimes you want to slap them. <laughs> but the truly spiritual man or woman of God can hug somebody when he feels like slapping them. <laughs> Completely forgive them when he wants to take revenge. Stay someplace he doesn't want to be. Get away from some place that he'd like to stay at. Break off a relationship with a friend that is poisoning their life, even though they know they're going to be judged and criticized for doing it. Some of you could change your life radically if you would just get away from some of the people that you let influence you. Well, I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be lonely. Well, I guess you'd just rather be depressed and miserable and stressed out and burned out. You know what? Those people probably don't care about you anyway. I'm sorry to say that, but that's just probably the truth. But God loves you, and he'd love to hang out with you. And he'll give you some good friends if you put him first. Come on. The Bible talks about three kinds of men. The unregenerate man, somebody who doesn't know anything about God at all. The spiritual man, the man who lives according to the word of God and doesn't bow down to his own thoughts, will, or feelings. The truly spiritual man. And then it talks about the carnal man. Paul talked a lot about carnality, the carnal man. And that's what I was for so many years of my life. I had a love for God. I actually was born again. I, I would have gone to heaven if I would have died. But I didn't know anything. I was just as ignorant as I could be. I thought I knew everything, though, because I went to church all the time. But I didn't know anything. <laughs> and so I walked in the flesh all the time. And I wasn't a good representative for Christ or for Christianity. I went to church, but during the week, you couldn't see much difference in me and any other unbeliever. I thought, oh, there was a little. You know, I would get convicted if I, you know, like one time one of my bosses wanted me to lie for him and kind of covertly help him steal some money that somebody owed him. And, you know, I, I knew I couldn't do that. I, I took a real stand where that was concerned. I was even willing to lose my job rather than do that. But... I gossiped and murmured and complained. I was manipulative, controlling, selfish, and self-centered. I know that none of you are like this, but <laughs> I was. <laughs> and sadly, there's just way too much of that in the church. And God's got a higher calling on our life than to live like that. Let me close with this thought. I love what the Apostle Paul said. And I say this for my life, and I pray that you'll begin to say it for yours. In Philippians 3, he said, For I am determined to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus died to take hold of me. I am determined to take hold of that. Let me amplify it a little. I'm determined to live that life and be that person that Jesus died for me to be. Amen. When do we really know something? At least know it in a way where it's really going to impact our lives. How deeply do we need to know something for it to affect, say, our behavior or even how we think? You know, I think very often we tell people to read the Bible, but I really believe that we need to study the Word of God. I don't think we need information nearly as much as we need revelation in the Word of God. And I'm offering you today the Everyday Life Study Bible. It's taken from the Amplified Bible. 
It's full of my teaching notes, full of lots of special things that we want to say to you that will help you really understand the Word of God. And I want to really encourage you to get this Bible and take some time every day to study. Yes, reading is good. Any information that we get is good. But the Bible teaches us that we're to meditate on the Word of God, and that's a deeper level of knowing. So remember, you don't know something just because you heard it once or because you read it once. You only really know it if it's working in your everyday life. God bless you, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Receive the insight and understanding of the power of God's Word when you add the Everyday Life Bible to your study tools. Alongside the life-changing biblical messages are some of Joyce's personal study notes and life lessons to help apply scriptures to our daily lives. The Everyday Life Bible will be yours for an offer of $40 or more. Call us toll-free at 1-800-727-9673 or visit us at JoyceMeyer.org. It's time to give God the hurts of your past and let Him give you the healing and restoration you're longing for. Joyce's classic book, Beauty for Ashes, will help guide you to receive God's freedom and peace. Beauty for Ashes, available now from Joyce Meyer Ministries. You know, women really do work hard and they have a lot of responsibilities. And so they really do need a break from what would be considered a normal routine. When you come to a women's conference, you totally shut everything out to set aside special time to be with God and just have a really good time. I think that when women get together, that something special can really happen. proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Listen to me, let me tell you something. Just this one thing that I'm telling you can be life-changing if you'll do it. Who's here tonight that's learned to confess the Word of God out loud and you've seen a radical change in your life because of that? Isn't that amazing? Well, the rest of you don't have your hand up. You ought to try it. <laughs> this book of law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. That means roll it over and over and over in your mind and mutter it under your breath. And don't tell me, ladies, that you don't know how to mutter because I know that you do. But you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe and do according to all that's written in it. The way that we do the word is by meditating on the word and speaking the word. You speak the word, you meditate on the word, and it gives you the spiritual strength to do the word. For then, then when, after you've done it, for then you shall make your way prosperous and you shall deal wisely and you shall have good success. How about learning how to use your mind to help you instead of letting it be a garbage dump for the enemy? You say, well, I can't help what I think. Well, you see, this is our problem right here. And I thought like that for a lot of years. I just, whatever I thought, that's what I thought. If I woke up in the morning and I thought, I feel depressed, then I would just go around all day and feel depressed. If I woke up in the morning and I had this thought, you know, Dave doesn't pay any attention to me. He, need, he, doesn't, he doesn't do anything special for me. Then... I just get madder and madder all day and feel sorrier and sorrier for myself. If that ever happens now, which it rarely does ever happen, I just think that's a lie. Dave does all kinds of things for me. He's a great husband. He's this, he's this, he's that, and he's that. And then maybe the devil will say, well, yeah, but he's not that. And I'll say, yeah, but he is this and this. Let me tell you something. The devil's going to talk to you. You might as well learn how to talk back to him. And I know there's people that think, Probably people watching my TV, you think, this lady is crazy. <laughs> she is talking about talking back to the devil. Well, all you got to read is Luke chapter 4. Jesus did it first, and I can do anything he did. The Bible says that the devil said unto him, and he said unto the devil. There's a lady that we had, had her testimony recorded, and we used to play it, but we don't anymore. And she said, I mean, she was like some offbeat, weird religion that had nothing to do with Christianity and was just miserable, and she 
happened to come across my program and she thought I was a stark raven mad. She said, here's this woman on television screaming, and Jesus said to the devil, and the devil said to Jesus, and Jesus said to the devil. And she said, but then I kept kind of coming back to the program and coming back to the program. Long story short, she ended up getting saved, became a partner with the ministry, and her life has been completely turned around. You know, a lot of things that we think make sense are stupid, and a lot of things that we think are stupid make more sense than anything if you really begin to look at them in the right way. How many of you believe that, the, that there is an enemy, that you have an enemy that whispers things to your mind and to your soul that are lies from the pit of hell? They are not the truth, and if you believe them, you will be destroyed. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that I found this out because he had control in my mind for way too long. I was a born-again Christian, but nobody ever told me what I'm talking about here tonight. So I was born again, but my mind was full of junk all the time. And so therefore, I was mad all the time. I was upset all the time. I was jealous of people. I was greedy. I was selfish and self-centered, but I was saved. I, I would have gone to heaven. I believe that because I really trusted Christ for my salvation. But nobody ever told me that my mind made one bit of difference to the outcome in my life. And I'm asking you tonight to take an inventory of your thoughts. What's been on your mind lately? If you're depressed, what have you been thinking about? If you're angry, what have you been thinking about? If you're bitter, what have you been thinking about? Oh, you guys look too innocent. I must have the really super saved group here tonight. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll just talk to these poor folks on television that maybe don't have it all together. Amen. We can have our mind renewed according to the Word of God. Let's take a, just a second and look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And I know some of you, you know these scriptures and You've probably got them underlined in your Bible, and that doesn't make me one bit of difference because you need to hear them again, and I do too. Do not be conformed to this world, fashioned after and adapted to its external customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind. Amen. So how are we changed? First, our mind has to change, and then our life changes. We don't think the way that we used to think, but we begin to actually believe this book and think like God thinks. My goodness, do you know how many problems people have because of the junky thoughts they think about themselves? I'll tell you what, you're looking at a woman, I would be petrified anymore to think bad junky thoughts about myself because I know it so displeases and so dishonors God. He sent his only son to die for you. He loved you enough to pay an awful price for you. And who do you think you are to have bad, terrible, junky thoughts about yourself? If God loves you, then you can love you. Amen. I said, if God loves you, then you can love you. You don't think, you don't need to think I'm stupid. You think I have the mind of Christ. You don't need to think I can't do anything. You look at Romans 12 and you say, I'm gifted and talented. There's something that I can do and it's important to the people in the body of Christ that I fulfill my part. Quit letting the devil drag you down through wrong thoughts that don't agree with the Word of God. I have the mind of Christ. I'm gifted. I'm talented. I'm anointed. Learn how to talk like God talks. Learn how to see yourself the way He sees you, and your life will change radically. Ephesians 4.22. Verse 22 in Ephesians 4 says, Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old unrenewed self which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. Now if you can discipline yourself for a minute, don't look at verse 23, look at verse 24. And put on the new nature, the regenerate self created in God's image, God-like, in true righteousness and holiness. Now if I just say to people, put off the old man and put on the new man. Stop acting the way you used to act and act the way God wants you to act. People may say, yes, I want to do that, but how can I do it? Something's missing. The bridge is in verse 23. Verse 22 says, put off the old man 
and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude and now you can put on the new man recreated in Christ Jesus I can't wear the new man if I'm gonna have old thoughts amen I have to have my mind renewed I believe that God wants to prosper us so you need to have a an image that God wants to bless you I believe that God wants to use you so you need to have an image that you're usable material and the enemy will come along and whisper to you well I don't you remember what you did say yes and that makes it all the more exciting that God could use somebody that was such a mess like me I tell you something he'll leave you alone if everything he tries to lie to you about you turn it into something good thank you for reminding me how much God has forgiven me for that just makes me have even a better day than I was going to have. You know something I've been doing every day for, well now, almost going on six months. I believe that God wants us to aggressively believe that good things are going to happen to us. I don't think we're going to say, well, I hope something good, you know, I wish something good would happen. You know, hope, I'm fresh on this because I'm writing a book right now on hope. Hope is a happy anticipation that something good is going to happen. Can you wake up in the morning and when the enemy whispers to you and says, this is going to be a lousy day, you say, I'm so excited, God, because I believe that something good is going to happen to me today. I believe that something good is going to happen in the world. Something good is going to happen in the government. Something good is going to happen in my family. Something good is going to happen to me at work. I am not going to sit around and be a Christian sourpuss believing for everything negative that the devil wants to throw at me. I am determined that I am going to live the life that Jesus died to give me and I believe that something good is going to happen in my life. Amen? I've decided to call this little book that I'm finishing up on hope the happy book. I tell you what, if you can live with hope and be a prisoner of hope and refuse to get hopeless and negative, there is just absolutely nothing the devil can do with you. He has lost control when no matter what he does, you say, God's going to work this out for good. Something good is bound to happen to me any moment. And it doesn't matter how much bad stuff has happened in the past. You say, well, what if I believe something good is going to happen today and it don't? Then get up tomorrow and believe again. What if it don't happen tomorrow? Then get up and believe again. And I'll tell you what, you can outlast the devil. And pretty soon he'll cave in and you'll have the victory. Characteristics of a healthy mind. First of all, a healthy mind is peaceful. Wow. Can I suggest that we learn to love simplicity? We live in such a complicated world today. And there's not very much that's just sweet and plain and simple anymore we need to learn to love simplicity and to purposely keep our lives as simple as we possibly can doesn't that sound good yes. Philippians 4 6 and 7 do not fret or have any anxiety about anything but in every circumstance and in everything <laughs> by prayer and petition definite request with thanksgiving continue to make your wants known to God how awesome is that? Don't worry about anything. Just tell God what you want. Be thankful for what you got. Stay happy and watch God work. And the peace that passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Now, I asked a couple of people back in the back before I came out here. Now, what do you think the biggest problem that people have with their minds? And we all came up with some version of worry anxiety worry stress and the Bible teaches us that and I'm going to take you to a scripture in just a minute that really worry is actually pride of the human flesh thinking that well if I rotate my mind around this long enough I'll figure out an answer let's look at first Peter 5 6 and 7 Philippians 4, 6 and 7, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation, 
And that doesn't mean to have a poor opinion of yourself. It just means to know yourself and that apart from God, you're a weak human being that can't do anything. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due time, he may exalt you and lift you up. Now, how do we humble ourselves? Here it comes, verse 7. Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on him, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Dave Meyer's answer to every dilemma in life is cast your care. If he has told me that once in our 47 and a half years of marriage, he has told me that 5,000 times. Cast your care. Cast your care. Well, it's been hard for me to be honest because I wanted for a long time for him to sit around and worry with me and he just wouldn't do it. <laughs> Cast your care. Cast your care. Cast, well, we got to do something. Well, do you know what to do? No, I don't know what to do. Well, then cast your care. <laughs> you know, here's the thing we need to do. We need to do our responsibility and cast our care. Our responsibility is to pray, give it to God, be open to doing anything that God asks us to do, but not to feel the pressure of thinking we have to go do something when we have no idea what to do and the more we try to do, the worse we make the situation. Amen? There's nothing wrong with you if you don't worry about your children. I said there's nothing wrong with you if you choose not to worry about your children. You know what? Not to be negative, because I really try to stay away from that, but you know, there's a semi-good chance that your kids are going to make a few bad mistakes, a few wrong decisions. But hey, you're still here. Come on. You made it. And sometimes the only way people get it is to take the wrong path for a period of time to find out, well, this is not working. I don't want to do this anymore. So instead of worrying ourselves sick, over our kids and their decisions, we need to be a good example to them. We need to pray for them. We need to live the life in front of them, and we need to watch God work in their lives. <laughs> Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Don't even think that you can solve your problem. See, there would have been a time when I would have worn myself out trying to change Dave's mind about the car. Well, you know, I mean, I guess if I would have had a big enough fit, he would have maybe not bought the car, but it would have messed up the peace in our home. It would have put a, a rift between us. And that's not the way God wants us to live. The Bible says we're called to peace. We're called to peace. So you know how I look at it now? You know what, God? If you don't want him to have that car, you can change his mind. If you do want him to have it, I'm not going to change his mind. This is not my problem. It's between you and him. If he wants to be 74 and drive a race car up and down the street, <laughs> praise the Lord. I'm not riding in it. I want a comfortable ride. Amen? I'm serious. Stop trying to make everybody else do what you want them to do. Uh-oh, now I'm preaching good. I said stop. <laughs> Come on. Stop trying to make everybody else do what you want them to do and have some peace. Run your life and stop trying to run everybody else's. Do you know how many times a week I have to say to myself, Joyce, it's none of your business. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. Because I like to get into stuff. And it, <laughs> come on, is there anybody here you like to get into stuff? Okay, well, you better learn my secret. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. <laughs> Keep your peace, shut your mouth, stay out of it. It's none of your business. And you know what? It works. And I've got so much peace now. I mean, when I first started getting peace, I was bored because I'd never had any peace in my whole life. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. I was bored. I didn't know what to do with myself. It was like, hmm. <laughs> Boy, now I just love it. I'm like, <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Cast your care on him, for he careth for you. 
You know, I believe that God wants to promise you tonight that he will always take care of you. But I also have to say that he won't do it if you're trying to take care of yourself. Now, obviously, you're going to do the things that you need to be doing to take care of yourself. But I'm talking about worrying about everything. The only way that we get God's deal is if we stop trying to do it ourselves. Cast your care on God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. In due time, it may take a little time. So if, it, if you don't get a result right away, don't think God's not working. Matter of fact, every time the enemy tells you, well, God's not doing anything, you say, God's not doing anything I can see yet, but he's working in the spiritual realm, and it is going to happen. Something good is going to happen to me today. You got to do that. Just because you don't see anything doesn't mean God's work not working. Matter of fact, what we see, suddenly we get a breakthrough, but we're seeing the result of what God's been doing sometimes for years. And now all of a sudden it's, oh my gosh, that was God. <laughs> Amen? I'm telling you, good things are on the horizon for you. Don't you quit and give up and think that they're not. You keep saying, I'm expecting something good to happen in my life. And you wonder if that's okay to do that. Well, do you think God wants you to sit around and expect something bad? Oh, I don't know. I'm just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. Well, you know, if you're not expecting nothing, then nothing's what you're going to get. Example, a woman may worry about her children, her finances, her husband's faithfulness, what people think. It may contribute to her problem. It could even have created her problem. But one thing it won't do is solve her problem. <laughs> Worry is useless. It's powerless. Here's the definition in Webster's 1828 dictionary, which is a great dictionary. The word worry means teasing, troubling, harassing, or tearing. To vex or persecute brutally, to fatigue. And I wrote down here, worry equals ulcers and stress. There's nothing in this definition that says it's going to do anything good. Trust in God is the only way to stop worrying. And I honestly don't think, I'll just tell you what I think after all these years of experience. I don't think that anybody is going to stop worrying until they really come to the point where they know that they're not smart enough to fix their own problems that only God is. I, I don't, you know. I'll be honest and tell you, I don't have what it takes to run this ministry. I mean, if it was based on me, I shouldn't be up here. But I don't worry about it. I don't know how to get the money we need to run this ministry. I can't even count that high. I don't know how to do that. But I've, I've learned it's not my problem. It's God's deal. And you know what? He always comes through. We get ourselves in so much trouble worrying. What we need to do is cast our care on God and watch him do miracles in our lives. Come on, I dare you to go to sleep tonight without worrying. Now, a healthy mind is not confused. It has clear direction or it's clear that direction's coming. Even though you don't maybe have that clear direction yet, you can be clear that that direction will be given to you at the moment that you need it. Even though you don't know what to do right this moment, you will know what to do when you have to do something. Amen? Confusion in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Lack of order, a mixture of several things, agitation and distraction caused by conflicting ideas. God is not the author of confusion. Stop living off the top of your mind and learn how to live by discernment. Discernment means you don't know what to do. You have this option. You have that option. You don't feel really good in here about this one. But when you think about this one, you got peace. This one doesn't even make as much sense. This one over here makes more sense mentally. It seems like it should be the thing to do. I mean, it's kind of what my friend said I should do. But I don't, something just don't feel right about that. But when I go over here to this more unreasonable one that doesn't seem to make much sense, that people aren't even advising me to do, man, I feel good about this one. Well, you're going ha to have to make a decision. Are you going to learn to live by the discerning of the Holy Spirit 
Or are you going to go with what your mind says to do? Can I tell you something? God sometimes asks us to do some really unreasonable things. And I'm not talking about just living goofy and, and doing stupid stuff. But I mean, God doesn't work the way the world does. His ways are above our ways. And he, he does things differently. I mean, if you really think about it, the plan of salvation just makes no sense at all. I mean, how can you figure that out? But when you read it, it's like you know in here that something wonderful happened on that cross. Now, you try to explain it to somebody that's not spiritual. You try to explain tithing to somebody that doesn't have God in their life. I remember an accountant doing my taxes one time looked at me and he said, why are you giving all this money away? I said, well, I believe what the Bible says, that if you give to God, he'll give back to you. Well, you don't have to give this much. You could give a lot less. I said, no, I really can't do that because that's not what God says. He didn't understand it at all. I understood it because I understood it in the spirit. We have no idea how much God would tell us if we would just stop thinking things to death. You know, you can kill something. You can kill a creative idea from God thinking it over. I mean, you're like, whoa, man, God, that's a great idea. And then you go, now, let me think about this. And I'm not suggesting that we just jump off and whoo, do kinds of stuff without giving it any thought. But if we're going to think about it, let's think about it with the mind of Christ, not the mind of the flesh. Is anybody with me tonight? How many of you know that discernment is so wonderful? You know, a healthy mind is a made-up mind. The power of the mind is absolutely amazing. And we need to learn to think the way that God thinks. We need to learn how to fight the battle for a healthy mind. You know what? If you maybe have been hurt in the past and you really want to recover from it, you're going to have to really make your mind up that you're going to recover and to know that God really wants you to have an awesome life. Today we're offering you an action plan which includes CDs and DVDs and a workbook and a journal. And it's, a, it's called Beauty for Ashes. And it's about how you can give the ashes of a messed up life to God and he will return beauty to you. I had a lot of emotional hurt in my life from being abused and God has done an amazing job in helping me recover and be all that he wants me to be. And he's making the same offer to you today. So get this material and let it begin to really change your life. Escape the prison of your past with the Beauty for Ashes Action Plan. With over four hours of Joyce's teaching on CD and DVD, a personal application workbook and journal, the Beauty for Ashes Action Plan will help you change your perspective on the past and live a life as God intended, filled with joy and purpose. It's available today for your donation of $35 or more. Contact us right now, 1-800-727-9673. Morning. There's an easier way to take Joyce with you. Watch episodes of Enjoying Everyday Life or read the daily devotional on the Joyce Meyer Ministries app. Download it for free today. The Joyce Meyer Conference is coming to Atlanta, Georgia, August 13th through 15th with worship by Highlands Worship Band. For more information and complete conference schedule, visit us at JoyceMeyer.org or call toll-free 1-866-C-JOYCE. Grab some friends and join thousands at the 2015 Love Life Women's Conference. It's nice just to kick back with a bunch of women that know what you're going through or have been in the same place that you have. I mean, I came expecting, but I got so much more. God is not mad if we've not arrived. He's just happy that you're here today wanting to learn more. Sometimes you just have to take that leap of faith and you will not be disappointed. Your journey is waiting for you. Register today. Thank you, friends and partners. Together, we're sharing the love of Christ around the world. To find out more, please contact us or visit us online at JoyceMeyer.org. Join us in partnership as we share the love of Christ around the globe. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. 
The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Father, thank you for the word today. and I believe that for some people, they're going to hear something today that's going to really be a turning point for them. So I thank you for the word. Help me deliver it just exactly the way you want it done and help every person to stay focused and hear exactly what they need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to open your Bibles up to Isaiah 61. First of all, let me say that Jesus can heal you everywhere you hurt. Everywhere. If you're hurting spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially, in relationships. I want you to grasp hold of this next thing I'm going to say. There's no area in your life that God doesn't care about. Nothing. There's nothing in your life that he doesn't care about. And there's nothing in your life that you can't bring to him and ask him to help you with. Now, I think that's a great revelation that probably... Christians all over the world need to hear because I spent many years of my life as a believer thinking that, I mean, I don't even know that I consciously thought this, but I didn't have any idea that God was interested in any part of me other than the spiritual part of me to forgive my sins and help me get to heaven. I, first of all, I didn't even know I had a mental problem. I thought everybody else in the world had a problem. I didn't know that it was my thinking. I didn't really know that I had emotional problems. I mean, I knew that I got upset easy and I knew that I was angry a lot. And, you know, I don't even know that I really knew that I was insecure. You know, I was real manipulative and controlling. And, you know, we, when, when we're all messed up in order to survive it, we find ways to mask it. We put masks on it and we make excuses for it. And we can easily convince ourselves that everybody else has got a problem. And if they would change, then we'd be okay. Yes, no, maybe. is upon me 
because the Lord has anointed and qualified me to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek, the poor, and the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up and heal the brokenhearted. Now, I believe that the world is filled with brokenhearted people. Now, what really does that mean? Just so we can make it practical. I think that to be brokenhearted means to be broken in personality. It means that we're not functioning the way that God wants us to function if we were functioning at our best. I mean, the way that I behave and my relationships with people now, and especially the way that I behave and my relationship with my husband is so amazingly different than the way I behaved 40 some odd years ago when Dave and I first got married. To be honest, when I look back, I think, I don't know how in the world you stood me or put up with me. And yet God did give him a grace because God saw my heart. And the good thing is, is God not only sees where you're at, he sees where you're going to be if he works with you a little bit. Amen. And just kind of as an aside here, sometimes God will assign you to a brokenhearted person. I know we all want somebody that's all fixed up and put together and perfect so they can make us happy. But honestly, we pray we want to be used by God. And, you know, Dave, I mean, this is what I'm going to tell you. Here's the absolute truth. Dave was 26. I was 23 when we met. I'd already been through a bad marriage and a divorce. Five years of being married to somebody that mistreated me after already being mistreated for most of my life. I had one child that, interestingly enough, I named David. And um, he pulled up out in front of my mom and dad's house to pick up a guy that he worked with. And I was out there washing my car and I had on short shorts and had one of those big beehives. And, you know, he's, he, he was, Dave was praying for a wife. He said, I want, told the Lord, I want to get married. I'm ready to get married. And he's a man that definitely believes that faith without works is dead because he was dating three different women at the time. So he, he wasn't much on just being passive and sitting around. He, he was after it. And he said he knew that none of those three were right. So when he saw me, he said, hey, if, when you're finished washing that car, you want to wash mine? Well, you know, I didn't trust men, and I was a sarcastic, you know, little snot. And I turned around, and I said, if you want your car washed, wash it yourself. <laughs> and he said what went off on the inside of him was, that's the girl for me. So maybe he is mentally ill after all. I don't know. <laughs> but here's the thing. When he began to pray for a wife, listen to what he said. He said, God, make it somebody that needs help. Now, honestly, I wonder how many people would have the courage to pray that prayer. Is anybody here that wants to get married ever said, God, I want to get married. Make it somebody that's all messed up that I can help. But here's the thing to remember, there are a lot of people out there that need help. And I was somebody, I had, I had been aware of God since I was a little girl, and I so wanted to serve God. I mean, I really wanted to live right and to serve God. I had a good heart, but I had a broken personality. I was broken inside. And I didn't need somebody just to tell me about Jesus, because people had done that. I needed somebody to show me Jesus. Come on now, listen. And maybe God has put you with a brokenhearted person, a person who's a little messy, a little not so easy to get along with, but there, there's a spark there. There's something worth saving. And maybe God just wants you to be there. You know, I think that there's a great ministry called the ministry of being there. Did you hear me? Sometimes we don't need to preach to somebody. That can actually be the worst thing we do. Sometimes we just need to be there and we need to be a Christian, not a religious Pharisee. There's a difference. Come on, folks. But just be a real Christian consistently. And somebody can say, well, maybe there is a different way to live than the way I'm living. 
You see, I was so messed up, I didn't even know what peace was. I didn't even know that peace was possible. I lived in an angry household with ranting and raving all the time and just a lot of, you know, sin and wickedness and abuse. And I grew up, everything in my life, I was rooted in fear. And so I had no idea what peace was like. And here, God gives me this man because even when I was married to my first husband, now this is how God hears your prayers. Even when I was married to my first husband, I would lay in bed beside him at night and pray, God, please give me somebody someday in my life that will really love me and make it somebody that will take me to church. That was my prayer. Please give me somebody that will really love me because I knew that that guy didn't love me. I really knew when I married him it wasn't going to work out, but I was desperate. And desperate people do really stupid things. And so for years, and it got a little better each year, but for years, Dave just was consistently a man of God. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't confront me. That doesn't mean that he, we didn't, you know, ever talk about my behavior, but Dave was happy in front of me. He wasn't going to let me steal his joy. He was peaceful. He was forgiving. He was just a wonderful example. And he actually made me hungry and thirsty for what he had. Doesn't the Bible say that you are the salt of the earth? Let me ask you a question. Are you making anybody thirsty for what you have? Is anybody looking at you and saying, man, I would love to be like that? I didn't even know a life like that was possible. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out for good measure that, you know, sometimes you have to be willing to suffer through some things that are not very pleasant for you for the salvation and the healing of another individual. <laughs> to be honest, I think we might just go ahead and say that I think sometimes we are overly concerned about what we're getting out of everything and rather not it's making us comfortable. And, you know, maybe we should just stop praying and asking God to use us if we don't really mean it. Oh, well, I'll go on. <laughs> he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim or declare liberty to the physical and spiritual captives and the opening of the prison and of the eyes to those who are bound. What a wonderful first scripture here. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of his favor, and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. And you know, the acceptable day of the Lord is always this day. This day is the day that you can begin a healing process in your life. This day is the day that you can be saved. This day is the day that you can be touched by God. This day is the day that you can have a complete turnaround in your life. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. It can be this day. Jesus is not the great I will be. He's the great I am. Amen. And he's here for you today. And even the better news is, is you cannot and never will be able to deserve anything that Jesus has done for you, and neither can I. So we need to learn how to just receive like little children and be very grateful that God loves us. Now, to grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in Zion, verse 3, Isaiah 61, 3. To grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in in Zion. Is there anybody here that's done enough mourning to last you a lifetime and you're ready for some joy? <laughs> to give them an ornament, a garland, a diadem of beauty instead of ashes. Hallelujah. Now, beauty for ashes. Now, that means that you can take a burned up trash can life <laughs> and you can bring it to Jesus he'll take even that and he will give you back something beautiful come on but 
Now, let me say something important, and this is a real key here. It's nice to read scriptures like this and say, oh, yes, I want beauty for ashes. But you have to give up your ashes before you get the beauty. Well, now, what do you mean by that? Well, bitterness, resentment, chip on your shoulder, bad attitude, self-pity, <laughs> being negative, a passive lazy spirit that sits around and wants everybody else to do something for them all the time, but they won't do anything for themselves. Come on, I had all that going on in my life, every bit of it. I didn't even know the beauty was available, but even after I found out, I still wasn't ready to give up my ashes. You know, sometimes we just like to, just kind of enjoy, as dumb as it is, we enjoy sitting around and feeling sorry for ourselves all day. You got to give that stuff up. That's not going to do you any good. If you really want to have a beautiful life, the first step is to forgive everybody who hurt you. Completely, totally forgive them. And yes, what they did to you is not right, but you are not hurting them by hating them. Please understand, you are not hurting anybody who hurt you by hating them or being angry at them. You are actually only continuing to hurt yourself, and the devil is having a party. Well, it's not fair. No, what people do to us is not fair, but there's a much better plan in God's Word. That is that God said, I will bring justice. And that means that God is the only one who can take wrong things and make them right. And God will do that, but you can't keep your ashes. Now, this is kind of where we're at today. Are you ready to totally forgive? Completely. Well, I've tried and I've tried and I just feel. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision you make about how you're going to treat people and how you're going to talk about them and how you're going to pray for them. I mean, you, you can just cringe inside when you see somebody that hurts you, that has hurt you, and that doesn't mean you can't forgive them and love them. Even love is not a feeling. It's a decision. No, we don't want to pray for our enemies to be blessed, but God says to do it, so there must be something amazing in it for us. I mean, I, I've even told God, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for them to be blessed, but I have to be honest and tell you, I really don't want you to bless them. <laughs> well, we don't need to play games with God. He knows everything. You know, I'm kind of afraid if I pray, you might answer my prayer, and I really don't want them to be blessed, but, you know, I'm going to do it in obedience to you, and, you know, I think, I think, God's answer might be, you, you, you don't have to worry about none of that. The first thing I'm going to bless them with is some revelation. It's not like if you pray for your enemies, they're going to get a new house and a new car. No. When we start praying for people, it means that God can open their eyes to see what's really, what they're really doing. You know, here's the thing. Hurting people hurt people. My father was so messed up. And he knew that sexually abusing me was wrong. But I'm telling you the truth. I remember the day that he looked at me like, I mean, I was in my 60s by then. And he was in, in his 80s. And he, and he said he'd never apologized to me. He finally got around to doing it. And he said, I had no idea that what I was doing to you was hurting you that bad. And I don't think people get it. He started seeing things on television about abuse and started getting a little revelation of what it does to people, and he had no idea. He knew it was wrong, and he knew it was selfish, but he had no idea what the long-term effects was going to be in my life. And I think a lot of people who hurt us, they're just acting out of their own pain, and they really don't have any idea what they're doing, and we need to just stop being mad about something all the time and be glad that God can take anything in our lives and work good out of it. Amen. What a joyful message the gospel of Jesus Christ is. The good news of the gospel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news, to bring you glad tidings and good news that there's nothing in your life that hurts you that Jesus can't heal. Now, he gives us beauty for ashes. 
the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a heavy burden and a failing spirit, that you might ultimately be called an oak or a tree of righteousness, lofty, strong, and magnificent, distinguished for uprightness, justice, and right standing of God, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So God wants to take us from being a total wreck of a mess to someone who is healed and whole and helping other people whose life glorifies him with every breath that they take. Now you talk about getting the devil back, let me tell you, that's payback he doesn't like. And then just verse 7 and 8, instead of your former shame, you shall have a twofold recompense. Instead of dishonor and reproach, your people shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double what they forfeited. Oh my, an everlasting joy shall be theirs. You know, I gave up some stuff. I never got to be a child, but I guess that would have been good. But now I have double, according to the word of God, what I would have had if I would have had a normal life. Don't sit around and be depressed because you never had a normal life. Give the thing to God. Give the broken life that you had. Give him your pain. Give him all your disadvantages. Give him everything that you've had a bad attitude about and let him give you back double what you lost. You're going to end up with a better deal in the long run than if you would have had the first plan to work. I mean, if we really understand this, how can we be in anything other than just so excited about our walk with God? And you know what? You'll never convince me that what I'm saying is not true. This is not a bunch of hype. This is not just a cheerleading session. It has happened to me. And I've seen it happen to lots of other people. Dave shared his story last night about his dad being an alcoholic and never being there for them and never coming to any kind of a uh, ball game. I mean, his dad just hid in the basement all the time and, and, and drank. They had like, back in, in those days, they had like old cellars and we had coal furnaces and there would be coal bins. And, and uh, then a lot of times after people weren't using those furnaces anymore, they would just be like an empty, dirty room. And that's where his dad hid his wine bottles. And, and that whole room was just full of wine bottles. And yet Dave had a godly mother and, he, and he, he was a godly man. And he served in the armed forces. And he wanted to help somebody. And he prayed for a wife that needed help. And my goodness, here we are now. And we could have just stayed too messed up, miserable, broke. He could have been bitter because he never had a dad. He could have become an alcoholic just like his dad. He could have been full of hatred. I could have been hating people all my life. I could have been a prostitute or done no tellings what. But God. But God. I wish today that you could just for five minutes have a glance of what I was like on the inside. Oh, I could dress it up and take it to church and put some paint on it and nobody knew. But honey, you didn't want to be in any kind of close relationship with me. Like I said, we can dress it up and take it to work or take it to church or go out in the shopping mall and but you, you get close to people, man, that's why a lot of messed up people are petrified of intimacy. They're afraid somebody's going to find out what they're really like. Verse 8, the first sentence, for I, the Lord, love justice. One of my favorite things about the character of God is that he's always just. Life is not fair, but God is just. Amen? Now, I don't believe that God just wants you to be hurt and live hurt. I don't even believe that God wants us to be healed and just live healed. I think he wants us to go on to step three, which is now I'm ready to help other people. So if you really want to make the devil mad and get him back for everything he did for you, you say, I'm not going to live wounded my whole life. I'm going to receive healing, but I'm not even going to stop there. I'm not just going to sit around and enjoy my good feeling of healing. I'm going to spend my life helping other people realize that what God did for me, he can also do it for somebody else. 
you know, you can put an end to generations of devastation if you'll be the one that will draw the bloodline of Christ across your life and say, this mess that came from my parents to me is not going from me to my kids. Don't pass it on. Now, emotionally unhealthy people have been wounded in their soul and they've never been properly healed. What is the road to healing? Well, I just wrote down a few steps here. Number one, believe God can work out anything that's happened to you for good. That's the first thing you need to believe. No matter what's happened to me, God can work it out for good. And if I were you, I would live with that belief every day of my life. Second, totally forgive. We've talked about that. Number three, renew your mind. If you've been hurt really bad, I can promise you that you don't know how to think right. Sorry, but you just don't. Not trying to be insulting, but you don't. There's no telling how many people that love God, their minds are so messed up. And they believe all these lies the devil has told them. Like, you can never overcome this. You're never going to be any good. You're used merchandise. I spent so many years of my life with a shame-based nature. I was ashamed of not just what my dad did to me, but I was ashamed of me because he did it. And I had a constant record playing in my head that, that just had, it was a one-line song. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Have any of you ever heard that? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Why am I not like other people? What's wrong with me? And you know what? I never hear that song playing anymore. Never hear that song anymore. Amen. Have you been hurt in the past? Do you feel wounded in your soul or like you have a broken heart? You know, God wants to exchange that brokenness for wholeness. He wants to give you beauty for ashes. But you must be willing to give up the ashes. We have to stop looking behind and begin to look to the future. God's got wonderful things in store for you. Today we're offering you an action plan, which includes CDs, DVDs, a workbook, and a journal. And it's on beauty for ashes. It's this whole teaching that's in the Word of God about how God will take all the bad things that have, been, that have happened to us, and He will work them out for good, and He will turn them into beautiful things in our life. Please let God do an amazing work in you, but He always does it through His Word. So please get the Word that we're offering you today. Just snuggle up with God, read, study, Pray, look, listen, learn, and you can be transformed by the power of God's Word. Escape the prison of your past with the Beauty for Ashes Action Plan. With over four hours of Joyce's teaching on CD and DVD, a personal application workbook and journal, the Beauty for Ashes Action Plan will help you change your perspective on the past and live a life as God intended, filled with joy and purpose. It's available today for your donation of $35 or more. Contact us right now, 1-800-727-9673. Well, most people, if they're going to come to the Women's Conference, unless they live in this area, they're going to have to spend some time to do it. But I honestly believe when we sacrifice in that way for our relationship with God, to say, you know, it's worth it to me to grow in Christ, to spend this time to make these arrangements, I believe that that honors God, and any time we honor Him, He honors us. Together, we are providing desperately needed medical care. We're feeding hungry children. We're giving homes to orphans. And you and I, with God's help, are doing more than we could ever do on our own. We are Joyce Meyer Ministries' Hand of Hope, and we appreciate you for being a part of it. Thank you, friends and partners. Together, we're sharing the love of Christ around the world. To find out more, please contact us or visit us online at JoyceMeyer.org. Join us in partnership as we share the love of Christ around the globe. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. If any one of us is serious about getting well and being a really victorious Christian, please listen to what I'm going to say. 
you will need one thing and if you will not do this one thing then nothing else that anybody does for you is ever going to work One of my favorite things about the character of God is that he's always just. Life is not fair, but God is just. Amen? Now, I don't believe that God just wants you to be hurt and live hurt. I don't even believe that God wants us to be healed and just live healed. I think he wants us to go on to step three, which is now I'm ready to help other people. So if you really want to make the devil mad and get him back for everything he did for you, you say, I'm not going to live wounded my whole life. I'm going to receive healing, but I'm not even going to stop there. I'm not just going to sit around and enjoy my good feeling of healing. I'm going to spend my life helping other people realize that what God did for me, he can also do it for somebody else. You know, you can put an end to generations of devastation. If you'll be the one that will draw the bloodline of Christ across your life and say, this mess that came from my parents to me is not going from me to my kids. Don't pass it on. Now, emotionally unhealthy people have been wounded in their soul and they've never been properly healed. What is the road to healing? Well, I just wrote down a few steps here. Number one, believe God can work out anything that's happened to you for good. That's the first thing you need to believe. No matter what's happened to me, God can work it out for good. And if I were you, I would live with that belief every day of my life. Second, totally forgive. We've talked about that. Number three, renew your mind. If you've been hurt really bad, I can promise you that you don't know how to think right. Sorry, but you just don't. I'm not trying to be insulting, but you don't. There's no telling how many people that love God, their minds are so messed up. And they believe all these lies the devil has told them. Like, you can never overcome this. You're never going to be any good. You're used merchandise. I spent so many years of my life with a shame-based nature. I was ashamed of not just what my dad did to me, but I was ashamed of me because he did it. And I had a constant record playing in my head that, that just had, it was a one-line song. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Have any of you ever heard that? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Why am I not like other people? What's wrong with me? And you know what? I never hear that song playing anymore. Never hear that song anymore. Amen. So renew your mind. And let me tell you something about renewing your mind. It's work. I'm going to tell you the truth. If you want to be a really on fire, victorious, more than conqueror Christian that God can use, it's going to take some work and some effort. And you know, just so you know, we're saved by grace, and everything that comes to us comes by grace. But grace is in no way opposed to making an effort. What grace is opposed to is earning, thinking that by what you do, the effort you put out, that now you deserve something from God. We will never deserve anything from God, but we make an effort to be all that God wants us to be because of what he's already done for us. I make an effort every day. Every day, I carve out that time that I need with God. Every day, I have to discipline my mind. Every day, I have to discipline my mouth. Come on. Every day, I have to be ready to not live offended. Every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. Oh, maybe once in a while if I stay home totally by myself with nobody but the dog, I can not, you know, not have to put out such effort. But honey, when I get around people, I can get along with everybody until the people come home. And I've even got some great people in my life. Receive mega doses of God's love for your emotional healing. Oh my gosh, you got to learn how to just swim in the love of God. God loves me, loves me, loves me, loves me. God loves me, loves me, loves me. Go look at yourself in the mirror and say, God loves you. Don't determine your value by how, by how people have treated you. 
And then understand the nature of emotions and learn how to manage them instead of letting them manage you. Just because you feel something doesn't mean that it's something you get to do. Now, are you ready to exchange beauty for ashes? If so, you've got to give up the ashes. Now we're going to look at some scriptures that, I don't know, if you listen to me all the time, you may be fed up with hearing about this crippled man in John, but Dave just tells me sometimes if, if we have to do the crippled man one more time, I'm glad I'm going to Madagascar. I haven't been there and I can talk about the crippled man all I want to and nobody will know. And then I'm going to go to Namibia and talk about him again because this, this guy is like the classic example of where we're at. <laughs> Is there anybody here who has never heard me preach about the crippled man in John 5? Awesome. <laughs> Dave said, one of these days you could just do a whole crippled man series. He said, you could just, because I also tell a story about me racing a crippled man in McDonald's for the last booth. So he said, you could have the crippled man in McDonald's, the crippled man in John 5. You could just do a whole crippled man teaching. And no, I'm not telling you about the crippled man at McDonald's. That goes with another story. All right, John chapter 5. You just have to, maybe you need to hear it again because you didn't get it the other 12 times you heard it. I don't know. Now, here's the deal. I'm just going to tell you about the first part of this. We're going to look at just a couple of verses. There was a pool. And let's see where the pool was. <laughs> It was near a sheep gate, and it was uh, Bethesda. And it had five porches, like openings, where you could go through these archways and be by the pool. And around this pool, there lay all kinds of crippled and sick people all year long. Because once a year, once a year, an angel came and stirred the waters up. And whoever got into the water first, one person, once a year, got a miracle. Now, you know, sadly, I think that's what a lot of us do. We just kind of don't do anything else all year, <laughs> but lay around hoping that we're going to be the one person that gets a complete breakthrough and doesn't have to do anything. Oh, yeah, this time you're going to get it. I believe you're going to get it this time. And um, verse 5, there was a certain man there who had suffered with a deep-seated and a lingering disorder for 38 years. Let me ask a question. How long have you had your mess? Ooh. When Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, Knowing that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to the man, I love this, do you want to get well? Are you really in earnest about getting well? Now, let me just stop there for just a minute and say to you, did you come to this conference just to see what I look like when I'm not on TV? <laughs> or did you come because you really want to press on with God And can I tell you something? Anytime we move on to something better, we've always got to leave something behind. So I just simply want to say, are you really serious about the changes in your life that you need? Are you ready to change instead of just wanting God to change everybody else that's around you so you can have a better life? Well, you know what? If you mean it, then God can give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You can become the planting of the Lord, a tree of righteousness, glorifying God every single day of your life. If you're really serious about getting well. Now, let me just say this for just, just maybe two minutes. If any one of us is serious about getting well and being a really victorious Christian, please listen to what I'm going to say. 
You will need one thing, and if you will not do this one thing, then nothing else that anybody does for you is ever going to work. You will need to learn how to study the Word of God. I don't think that you can just be spoon-fed victory. I'm grateful that you enjoy my TV program, and I pray that you'll watch every day. I'm so grateful you came to the conference, but I'll tell you, you need your own personal study time. You, your Bible, a notebook, the Holy Spirit, because I am a teacher. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. And I can give you a piece of the puzzle. You can maybe go to church tomorrow morning. Your pastor can give you a piece of the puzzle. And that's great. You need all of us. God gives the ministry gifts for the building up of the body that they might, might go out and do the work. But nothing is going to replace your time with God. If you were to ask me what is the one thing that I do that I believe, if, if I could say there's anything that I do that helps me be the person I am and do what I'm doing, I would have to say that it's my daily morning time with God. And I'm not saying that something spectacular happens every day. Matter of fact, I would say that most of the days are just frighteningly ordinary. But I'll tell you what I believe, and I believe this with all my heart. I don't think it's what I do in that time that makes that much difference. I think the thing that honors God is that we go to him and we give him the time because by doing that, we are saying, I cannot do anything worth doing without you. And any person who is too busy to spend time with God is too busy probably doing nothing that's bearing any good fruit in your life. And I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad. It's one area of your life where the devil will fight you more than anything else. It petrifies him to think that you might actually get to know God for yourself. Come on, you cannot have secondhand faith. You need your own relationship with God, your own experience with God. There was a certain man there who'd suffered with a deep-seated disorder for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there, he said, do you really want to get well? Or are you really serious? Verse 7, the invalid said, sir, oh my gosh, I just love this. Sir, I have nobody when the water's moving to put me into the pool. <laughs> but while I'm trying to come in myself, somebody else steps down ahead of me. Well, yes, Jesus, I want to get well, but I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. And even when I try, somebody else always gets ahead of me. And you know what? Jesus didn't say, oh, you poor fellow. Oh, bless your little darling heart. I understand. He said... Verse 8, get up. <laughs> How many of you see that exclamation mark? Get up. And I love this part. Pick up your bed, your sleeping pad, and walk. So he not, he not only said, get up. He said, clean up the mess you made the 38 years you've been living, laying here. We have to stop feeling sorry for ourselves, and we have to stop thinking that the world owes us something. This whole mentality today, this whole um, entitlement mentality, oh my gosh, it, it not only is terrible, but it is so dangerous. Nobody owes me anything. It is not somebody else's fault that my father abused me, and they don't have to pay me back for it. Because God said he would pay me back. He would give me double, double what I forfeited and gave up. But 
I'm not going to ever get God's double. <laughs> if I keep my bad attitude, my self-pity, my entitlement mentality, the chip on my shoulder, you got to give up the ashes. Come on. And you know, to be honest, when you've, had a, when you've hurt for a long time, there's almost like a deadness that settles in. And I hate to say it, but sometimes when I'm sharing things like this, I, I can look across the audience and I can kind of tell who's getting it and who's not. And because there's a spark of life that comes into people when they're connecting. But sometimes people have been hurt so bad for so long that they just kind of like, stir up your hope today. God's trying to just light one little spark of hope on the inside of you. And hope is the happy anticipation that something good is going to happen. Go on, I double dare you to just have even just a little tiny bit of hope. Faith the size of a grain of mustard seed can move a mountain. Just go ahead and make the devil mad and just say out loud, something good is going to happen in my life. God promises us transformation, not translation, but transformation. You say, huh? <laughs> well, you know, Enoch got translated. He just suddenly wasn't here anymore and he was with God, you know. <laughs> God doesn't promise us that when it comes to spiritual growth and change in our life. Enoch got translated because he was so close to God he couldn't stay here anymore. I wouldn't mind some of that, but I got a ways to go. Now, what I'm trying to say is, is, you know, you can't get a drive through breakthrough. This is not like ordering up a Happy Meal. <laughs> if you want a breakthrough, you got to go through. You don't drive through, you go through. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, let's go there. Verse 17, now the, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Freedom from bondage. And all of us, as with unveiled face, and you know, there's a lot of messages here. Bottom line is, when it says unveiled face, it means you, you need to read the Word of God with your grace glasses on, not read it like the law. Because when Moses received the law, even the law left such glory on his face that he had to wear a veil over his face. But now God is saying, if you want to come under this new covenant that I'm giving to you, this covenant of grace, you have to be careful that you don't read everything in here like an I have to, but you read it like, wow, awesome, great, I get to do this, and look at what's going to happen in my life. So you don't have to pray, you get to pray. You don't have to give, you get to give. You don't have to love people, you get to love people. You don't have to forgive people, you get to forgive people. You don't have to be a blessing. You can get up and be a grouch and just make people miserable all the time if you want to. But you don't have to live like that because he came to set us free more than anything from ourselves. Freedom for me now is not having to be upset any longer than seven minutes because my husband buys a race car that I didn't want him to get. Yeah, you weren't here to hear Dave's story last night. I'm not telling it again. Well, I will. Dave bought a car I didn't want him to get. Come on, let, let's do the tiny version. I'm in bed, almost ready to go to sleep, all cozy. The phone rings. Me and Danny, one of our sons, he said, we're at the Ford dealer. 
I'm like, what are you doing at the Ford dealer? I thought you were going to go get golf balls. And he's like, well, when we were done, we went to the Ford dealer. And, you know, there's a car here that I'd really like to get. Well, right away, my insides went. Because, <laughs> you know, we've been married a long time. We've been through the car thing a number of times, you know. <laughs> Any of you ladies tracking with me, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you can drive the same car till the wheels fall off, but, you know. I'm like, you got a, you got a nice car. Are you going to get rid of that car? No. This is, this is a race car. I'm like, Dave, you're 74 years old. Please. What do you need with a race car with these loud pipes on it so when you sit at a stop sign, it just sits there and grumbles? I'm like, don't you think I'm going to look a little ridiculous in this? Anyway, long story short. It was obvious he really wanted to get it. and Man, I just learned a long time ago, there ain't nothing worth fighting about. I, don't, I do not have the energy to be mad anymore. Is anybody home today? How many of you don't have the energy to be mad anymore about something you can't do anything about anyway? But it is a bit annoying when somebody's doing something that you don't like and they give you a scripture to back it up. And you see, the problem was that we didn't have a place in the garage to park the car. And so after we hung the phone up, I'm thinking, where's he going to put it? So I called him back and I said, where are you going to park the car? He said, well, I was thinking maybe you could get rid of your car. <laughs> well, just so it don't sound too bad, I don't drive the car anyway. You know, but it's, I mean, it's seven years old and got 12,000 miles on it. Dave bought it for me and it's just a cute little girl car. And, you know, I've, I've said numerous times in the last two years we should just sell that car get rid of it and he's like no you don't want to sell that car i bought you that car that's your car i want you to keep it <laughs> and so when he asked me about when i asked him about the parking place and he said well just i thought we might sell your car i said wait a minute i thought that you didn't want me to sell my car we've been going over this and over this and you kept telling me not to sell it he said well ecclesiastes says there's a time for all things <laughs> <laughs> Come on out. Could some of the ladies say boo day? Yeah, let go ahead, guys. Tell him, yay, Dave. <laughs> All right, straighten up. Let's get spiritual again. Here's the thing, this is freedom, that I did not have to get mad, that I didn't have to control the situation, that I could not get my way and still be happy. Come on, I'm not broken anymore. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds and heals their bruises. He gives them beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and he is a God of justice who gives you a double reward for everything that you lost. Have you been hurt in the past? Do you feel wounded in your soul or like you have a broken heart? You know, God wants to exchange that brokenness for wholeness. He wants to give you beauty for ashes, but you must be willing to give up the ashes. We have to stop looking behind and begin to look to the future. God's got wonderful things in store for you. Today, we're offering you an action plan, which includes CDs, DVDs, a workbook, and a journal, and it's on beauty for ashes. It's this whole teaching that's in the Word of God about how God will take all the bad things that have, been, that have happened to us, and He will work them out for good, and He will turn them into beautiful things in our life. Please let God do an amazing work in you, but he always does it through his word. So please get the word that we're offering you today. Just snuggle up with God, read, study, pray, look, listen, learn, and you can be transformed by the power of God's word. <laughs>